Now it is. Do you see the, the slide? Yes. Okay, great. So um, just this slide to precise that I have no any financial interest. In, in my lecture, I will give, uh, I will give the name of uh, several uh, implant system, but uh, I don't work for them. There is no financial relationship. And my lecture also today is for free without any fees, without any relationship with, with any company. So uh, my lecture will be about uh, the single uh, uh, loss of an anterior teeth in the upper jaw. And I, I will begin with the example of the maxillary lateral incisors agenesis. But after I will, sp I will speak about all the anterior teeth of the upper jaw. So uh, concerning the, the agenesis of the mat uh, maxillary lateral incisors, in the general population, it is 2%. That means that among your patient, regularly, once, twice a year, maybe more, you will uh, meet a, a patient with or one uh, agenesis of the maxillary lateral incisor and sometimes of the two maxillary lateral incisors. And uh, concerning all the agenesis, the uh, uh, lateral uh, incisors in the upper jaw is the second one. Uh, as you can see, the first one is the second lower premolar after the maxillary lateral incisors followed by the second uh, upper premolar, lower central incisors, lower second molar, and finally, lower second uh, uh, lateral incisors. Uh, when uh, we are confronted with a, a lateral agenesis, we always think about which kind of prosthetic procedure I will use to replace the tooth if we decide, decided to open the space. So let's think about opening the space and which kind of uh, prosthetic procedure we can use. So to determine the width of the lateral incisor, usually we think about measuring the control lateral tooth. But concerning peg-shaped maxillary permanent lateral incisors in, gener in the general population, it is about 1.8%. But when you have an agenesis on one side, on the other side, as you can see, there is a huge number of peg-shaped maxillary permanent lateral incisor on the other, other side, about 38 to 55 percent. So thinking immediately that you can uh, calculate the width of the later of the agenesis lateral, considering the control lateral tooth, sometimes it's impossible to use the control lateral tooth. So. A lot of proposals have been uh, done. The first one is to use the golden ratio. It is said that the golden ratio is found or in the nature or in all the, the, the things that human can create. For example, in architecture, concerning cars, but also on animals and flowers, for example. And the golden ratio have been proposed by, by an Italian from Pizza named Fibonacci. It was in the 11th uh, century. Concerning teeth, we can use the golden ratio only for the two central incisors. As you can see, the, the ratio between the eye and the width of the two central incisors is the golden ratio. And for the Pros laboratory. They have a golden caliper, as you can see. You can, you can buy it in a lot of uh, websites. For example, the Smile Line, which is a, a website from Switzerland, and they have this uh, golden caliper. But it's quite difficult to use the golden ratio for other teeth. You can see two photographies. On the upper one, it is the, the right uh, size of the teeth in the anterior area of the upper jaw. On the lower photography, they use the golden ratio for the lateral 
and also for the canine. And as you can see, the width of the lateral in the lower photo is narrower in comparison with the real tooth. So using the golden ratio to evaluate the width of the lateral incisors is not the good answer. Orthodontists use the Bolton index. I don't know if all the participants of, of this uh, webinar are orthodontics, but for those who are not orthodontics, the Bolton index is the sum of the six anterior upper teeth under the six anterior lower teeth. And the ratio is about 70, 75%. A well-known orthodontist in all the world who passed away about five years ago, Vincent Kokish, uh, offers on his website um, an Excel app. You can enter all the widths of the teeth in the anterior area and you will calculate automatically the width of the lateral incisor. Uh, when he passed away, his website was closed, but uh, uh, his son was very smart. He opened another website. You have the address on the, on the slide. Go directly to smartortho.com, and you will find first all the PDF of Vince Kokish, and he write a lot of papers of course, concerning the world of orthodontics, but also relationship with PROS, with PAIO. He, he writes a lot, a lot of paper also uh, concerning maxillary lateral incisor agenesis. So you can accede directly to, to his, his page and the tooth size calcul calculation. Finally, maybe the easiest way to evaluate the widths of the prosthetic solution. And I use the word prosthetic solution because at this time, I don't know it, if it will be a bridge, if it will be a bonded bridge, if it will be an implant. The best way maybe is to use occlusion. And with a setup to have a coincidence of the middle line of the upper and the lower jaw and to put the canine in class one. And automatically you will have the, the width of the space dedicated to the lateral incisors. At this time, you will exactly know if this width is compatible with the insertion of an implant or not. Uh, again, for all the participants who, who are not orthodontists, when orthodontists learn to bond braces on the anterior teeth, all the apex are convergent in an, in a, I will say, a, a, the nasal area. There is no pa strictly parallelism uh, between all the roots in the anterior area. And sometime when we had, when we decided to insert an implant to replace the lateral incisors, because of the convergence of the apex, it will be quite difficult. And regularly, I ask to my uh, auto referees to correct again the main axis of the, of the canine and of the central to have the bone corridor. When I receive a patient, it, here it is a, a young patient about 12 years old, and the auto referee send me the patient to have any information about the PROS solution, implants, uh, bridge, bonded bridge. The, the first thing I do before doing a CBCT is to do a plain uh, X-ray and to put on the X-ray the transparent which are given for free by all the implant company. And without any CBCT, I am able to give the beginning of the answer, is implant possible or not? And in this clinical situation, as you can see, the space between the, the two teeth is too narrow and it's quite impossible to insert at this time an implant. A lot of company propose those tapered implant and they say that the, one of the indication of the tapered implant is to replace an anterior upper teeth 
uh, and inserting in the in the reflection the fact that uh, the bone corridor is a little narrow, but even in this clinical situation, it's quite impossible to insert a tapered implant. I receive always the same question uh, from my auto referees: How many millimeter you need between the two teeth on the on the each side of a, a, a supposed inserting implant place? So my, my answer is always the same. We need minimum 1.5, but it's better if we can have two millimeter between an implant and the, 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 the natural tooth adjacent to the, to the future implant. In this slide, you can see we need between three and four millimeter on each side, 1.5, on left, 1.5 on right, and we, had, we have to add the width, the diameter of the implant. And usually in the anterior uh, maxilla, we will use a narrow implant that means about three millimeter diameter. We need also a certain quantity of bone on the buccal, but also on the palatal aspect. And, uh, we will be in the best condition if we add two millimeter of bone on the, on the buccal aspect of the implant, but also on the lingual. If we add two millimeter of uh, bone and the plaque control is uh, very high, the risk of bone loss is very low. If the width of the bone, the thickness of the bone on the buccal aspect of the implant is much narrow, um, the future of the bone volume can be uh, a little, uh, uh, a little uh, uh, worse if the plaque control is not good. Um, a lot of uh, well-known practitioners all around the world confronted with this clinical situation when the canine are in contact with the central. They say that if we decided to open a, a space for a future prosthetic solution. Implants, bridge, bonded bridge, uh, classic bridge, I will say. We will be confronted to a huge bone, a huge volume of bone. And a lot of uh, well-known pra practitioners give this postulate. You will see Kokish again, Bjorn Zakrisen, which is also a world, world, known in the auto world, I will say, but also Frank Spears, an American colleague who, who is a, a pros and with a very high level of, uh, of uh, result with, with all uh, his works. And all those three great names of dentistry say that opening the space allows the development of a large bone volume. Unfortunately, uh, several papers uh, evaluated the bone volume or on plaster model or with CBCT. And as you can see, there is a decrease of thickness. There is a decrease of vertical height and there is also a deepening in the buccal concavity. So the conclusion of all those uh, studies was that the bone crest move in palatal direction and become thinner. So in a lot of clinical situations, unfortunately, we need to add bone to realize a bone graft. So if we take those uh, seven uh, implants brand, the first one on the left is a French brand called Anto Antogir, but recently Stroman by Antogir company. You see also uh, on the slide, um, maybe on, on the right side, 3i, but 3i I've be, I been also recently by, by, bought by another implant company. In the, in the implant world, there is a huge, uh, of, uh, uh, huge mobility of company and to grow and to be more present in the implant world, they don't have any, enough time to wait for 10 years to develop what they call new, but in the great majority, it's not something new. So to be more present in the, in the implant world, they bought regularly as a company. 
And as you can see, the smallest one is 2.8. On the right side, the largest one is 3.25. But about half of millimeter between the implant on the left side and the implant on the right side, half millimeter are sometimes very important in the anterior area. Because sometimes orthodontists have real difficulties to open enough space to insert the implant without pulling the teeth in the buccal direction. So how many bone we need to insert, to put an implant between the two edges and teeth, mini minimum six millimeters, but we are a little more comfortable if we have seven millimeters. And in the bucolingual uh, aspect, it's about the same, six to seven millimeters. And in the great majority of the mouse, unfortunately, we don't have enough bone or between the edges and teeth or in the bucolingual direction. So of course, we know today how to, to augment the, the bone volume. We know how to take bone or in the mouth of the patient or outside. We know also how to use bone substitute. For example, in this paper, uh, dealing with ectodermal dysplasia and tusagenesis, one of the conclusion is that in the great majority of cases, we need to do a bone graft and sometimes also to amend the, the, the quantity of keratinized tissue. And the bone graft is needed between 16 and 85 percent. That means that the great majority of, of people without any lateral incisors, we need to do a, a, a bone graft. Let's have a look to those two uh, clinical cases. As you see, uh, there is uh, one uh, lateral agenesis and those two practitioner insert implants. But the result in the two cases are a little poor. On the, on the left side, you see that we, we, we see directly the platform of the implant. And on the right side, the, the ladies was not very pleased about the grayish aspect of the gum. So in the two cases concerning the direction of the implant, they are perfectly in the good direction. Unfortunately, the sickness of the buccal tissue, the buccal bone, but also the sickness of the buccal gum are not enough thick. So the, the, the aesthetic result in these two cases are very bad. Maybe we had to augment the bone, maybe we had to realize a bone graft, but maybe we can think we can think also about another proposal. Today we know how to augment bone, and facing this uh, uh, upper uh, area in the lateral incisor area, we know how to uh, make a bone graft, or taking a piece of bone in the mouth of the patient or as you can see in this photo, using a, a human bone graft coming from a bone bank. But uh, if you want to go from this initial situation to this wonderful result, it, it is not during one session. In, to uh, have this wonderful clinical uh, result, only about surgical concern, we do three surgery. First, reconstructing the bone, and second, reconstructing the gum. And when we expose the implant to insert the crown, we do also a third surgery to thicken the gum on the buccal aspect of this area. So when you propose a, an implant solution to your patient, don't forget to explain to the patient that maybe you will have to do several surgery. That means several minutes, several hours on your chair. And of course, the fee associated with the time you spend on the chair to accede to, those, to this wonderful result. So how implants evaluate with yours? The title of my slide is also Integration and Aging. And this is a paper, unfortunately written in French, 
uh, the, um, the issue of uh, this journal was about uh, the single edentulus. And the photo of the guy you see on the paper was one of my professor. He, he was an orthodontist. He retired three, four years ago. But he write uh, uh, this sentence in the paper after 30, 35 years old, there is only risk of aging, which may disturb the equilibrium, mainly due to periosteal remodeling rather than differential growing displacement. That means that late growing, I always heard about late growing, but growing stop, maybe at 20, maybe at 25. But even if growing stop, teeth can move all lifelong in the mouse. And one of the main explanation is the periosteal modeling and remodeling. But also, as all the orthodontist attendees knows, the, the growing of the mandible. I know that there is anterior growing, but also posterior growing. And orthodontists are the only that are able to, to precise if the mandible or if the, if, the face, if the facial will grow in, in a direction, anterior direction or posterior direction. So let's have a look to what we found in the literature. I will present you this first paper. It's, it's coming from Switzerland. And the main author is Jean-Pierre Bernard. Um, and he, he, they insert implants in the, in the mouth of two populations. As you can see, the first population is very young uh, people. Today, I will say that it's quite forbidden to insert implant between 25 years. And the second population is, I will say, adults from 40 to 55. You see that there is 16 central incisors, 12 lateral incisors, and 12 canine. And what they observed in the two population is that there is a vertical discrepancy between the pros on the central, on the lateral, and the canine, and the adjacent teeth. There is a vertical discrepancy. And this vertical discrepancy, they say the vertical steps is measured. And as you can see, even in the two groups, it's quite the same. It's about dot 10 to 1 dot 65 millimeters for the young uh, group, but it's quite the same for the mature adult. That means that if you, you decided to put an implant in the anterior maxilla in an adult uh, older than 40 years, even if you consider that he is old, you will observe in a great majority of cases an infraclusion of the implant supported crown. Here, you, uh, we are in the uh, Brandmark Clinic in Gothenburg in, in Sweden, and they have a 15 years follow up concerning the soft tissue around a, a, a single uh, crown supported uh, implant, and also the movement of the edges and teeth. And what they observed is the increasing of implant clini clinical crown height by apical migration of gum. But they also observed increasing of the natural crown height on natural teeth. And as we know, when we get older, we, had, we have also longer teeth, even if we don't have any periodontal problem. But there is a slow, migration of all the compound of the, of the periodontium in an apical direction, I, I insist, without any pocketing. It's not a pathology. But with the age, teeth seems much longer. As you can see, they consider that there, e, there is two high-risk population, female and initially so shorter teeth. Concerning the ages and teeth, they, they move. And there is also a higher incidence on female. And again, two uh, high-risk population, anterior face height and posterior rotation of the mandible in the female. Here we are again 
in the Brandmark clinic, and you can see that the follow-up is 16 to 22 years. So it's beginning to be very interesting. 21 patient follow-up. So concerning the ages and T's, there is eruption for 42 percent. And the recession in the mid fascial is higher than one millimeter for 21 percent. Here we are again in the Bradmark clinic, and the follow-up is 19 year 65 anterior implant, infraposition for 40 percent. No difference between young and old patient. We know this from the, the study coming from Switzerland. Again, two group of risk women, long faces, satisfied patient, less satisfied practitioner. It's very important to ask also the question uh, uh, to the patient. And this latest uh, study is from an Italian team. As you can see, there is 76 anterior implant, single anterior implant on 60 patients, two groups before 30 year old and after 30 year old. I see that there is a, a, a French word there. And the evaluation has been done on photos and plaster model. They created a score about the, the concerning of the patient. Are they interested about the fact that the, the implant is in infraposition or not? So the score zero is the patient see nothing. The score one, the patient is conscious, but he is not interested about it. The second, the score, the score two, the patient is conscious and he wants some explanation, but that's it. You don't want any treatment. And the score three, the patient is conscious, but he is asking for a treatment. So the results are very interesting. They observed that there is, there is infraclusion in 36, 70, 30, sorry, 73 percent. You see that there is a little difference between male and female. The infraclusion inferior of uh, 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 inferior for one millimeter is for 88 percent in male. 85% in female, and it is not, uh, it is not significant. Before 30 years, the infraclusion is for 47% after 52%. And what is also interesting is the score. I remind you that zero means that the patient don't see the vertical discrepancy. More or less, it's about 40 percent. The score one, you have seen it. That's it. The score two, you have seen it, you want some explanation. And the score three, you have seen it, you want some explanation. But you want also a treatment. That means that, mean that uh, about 20 percent of the people want a correction. Correction that means to do again a surgery to uh, increase the gum volume, but also to change the crown, to have again the crown in the good position in comparison with the adjacent teeth. That means that maybe we have to announce to our patient, maybe more if it is female, maybe more if they have eye faces, we have to explain them to them that maybe in 10 years, maybe more we will have to change the crown and to do a, a second surgery. But of course, it's not for free also. The, so you have to insert in all your consideration uh, this fact because it's, it's not few, as you, can know, as you know in your country, but it is the same in my, in my country. It's a certain amount of money, of course. In their study, they don't observe any uh, risk factor concerning age and sex. It is uh, uh, at the opposite of other studies. So now I want, to, I want just to present you several cases. This is a woman, she was in, uh, in vacation in the south of France. And the photo and the x-ray has been sent by one of my friends. 
Uh, this lady is 38 year old and she uh, had an implant uh, uh, 18 years before. Now you see that the implant is in the infra position. There is a diastema between the crown and the neighboring uh, tooth. Here we are only six years after. And this photo has been sent by, by one of my referees. On the left side, you see that there is a agenesis of the T22 and the implant and the crown have been inserted. And only six years after, as you can see, the main axis of the crown is definitely on the buccal direction. So six years after, you have to change the crown. Have a look at the upper jaw. Uh, this case has been treated by those uh, kind of aesthetic teams. We are in the south of France, the city of Nice. And as you can, as you can see, there is two practitioners Franck Ajej is a, a friend of, of mine, a, a, peri, a perio, and he inserted two implants in the, uh, because there is two lateral agenesis on both sides. And Jean Richel is a pros, and he, he put the two crown. And as you can see, the result is wonderful. The perio uh, succeed to recreate the convexity on the buccal aspect of, of the, the implant. Just have a look 10 years after, 10 years. Implant have been inserted when she was 21. And now she is 31. So we are, we are 10 years after. You can see that there is a huge vertical discrepancies, maybe about two millimeters. But have a look on the buccal aspect of the two implants. The, the, the connective tissue graft totally disappear and we can imagine that we have now concavity on the two buccal aspect of the, of the two implants. And I recently have on phone the perio uh, from Nice and he's, he tell me that they take the crown out. The, he does again a, a, a second uh, uh, perio surgery just to have connective tissue on the buccal aspect of the two implants. And they have done again two crowns. 10 years after. Uh, these cases have been treated, pre treated by two of my uh, teachers. Uh, they know when they put the crown on the left uh, central incisor that there will be in the future a vertical discrepancy. So they decided to put a, a, cr a crown a little longer than the ages and teeth. But as you can see, 10 years after, there is a vertical discrepancy, and uh, it, it seems that the, the crown on the implant is in a more buccal direction. Of course, the implant don't, don't move. The ages and teeth definitely moves. Here we are 22 years after. The implant have, has been inserted when the, the lady was 42, and now she is 64, so 22 years after and the latest one i have uh, i have treated this uh, patient a ma male patient with one of my teachers and i i put an implant on the t11 and as you can see 10 years after there is a vertical discrepancies uh, just have a look to a clinical case associated uh, uh, orthodontics implants and pros uh, a young lady, 32, she refused, uh, she or her parents, I don't know exactly, refused the treatment when she was an adolescent. So now she's a little uh, worried about uh, what she said whole in my denture. So the main uh, motivation is, in an, is an aesthetic one. Um, I will tell you when I had received the, these uh, young uh, ladies in my clinics. I don't have a look to these ladies before the orthodontic treatments. And definitely I think that before taking the decision, it's important that the patient goes to all the, the clinician, we will participate to the treatment. 
So the, these uh, photos and the X-ray you will see on the next slide have been sent to me by my auto referees, but after my first consultation. So as you can see, it is a class two bilateral maxillary incisor agenesis, uh, disharmony, normal diversions. You know maybe more than me about all this concern. I definitely think that you, when you treat a, an orthodontic patient, an adult orthodontic patient, you need to do a X-ray status, not only a panoramic and a profile X-ray. You definitely need to do an X-ray status. In my country, in France, uh, half of the patient between 35 and 65 years present a periodontitis. Half of the patient, 50% 50, 50 of adult patients in France have periodontitis. But in the United States, it's the same percentage. So when you treat adults, don't do only a panoramic. So as I told you, the auto do a setup. But at this time, I don't see the patient. But I ask the autos to send me the setup and I measure at the setup the, the space between the two central incisors and the two canine. On the right side, it was seven millimeters. On the left side, it was 6.5 millimeters. So theoretically, and I say again, theoretically, the space between the two teeth is compatible with the insertion of an imp a narrow implant, about 2.8, 3 millimeter maximum. So again, I don't see the patient at this time. The auto send me all the photos. And I receive the patient at, at this time. And with a wonderful le uh, letter, he tell me, I send you Lady X, and I think that it is time for you to insert the implant. Hopefully, the lingual braces are still in, in the mouse. And as you can see, there is only two resin uh, teeth, provisional resin uh, teeth to replace the two lateral incisors. So again, my reflex between doing a CBCT is to do a plain X-ray, a small one, and to, to make a superposition with the transparency uh, uh, given by all the implant company. And my first answer to this lady was to say, uh, um, on the right side, I think that you have enough implant or the distance between the two teeth is compatible with the insertion of one implant. But I think that on the left side, maybe it will be a little difficult. So at this time, I asked for a CBCT. And as you can see on the right side, definitely there is enough bone to insert a three millimeter diameter implant. But on the left side, it's impossible. And one of the interest of the, of the CBCT is to give to the auto the strictly movement he has to do for the, I will say next four to six months. As you can see, to open the space, he has mainly to do a torque in a palato distal direction, only to open the space. So to confirm uh, uh, my first uh, uh, thinking, I do a simulation. I do a simulation with uh, an app. So on the right side, definitely I can uh, insert an implant, but on the left side is totally impossible or I will touch one root, maybe the two roots. So the ladies was a little disappointed and I sent the, the lady to the auto, send him the, the, some photos of the CBCT, so he know exactly in which direction he had to move the canine. And the ladies came back to my clinics six months after, so again, I do a, uh, another CBCT and I confirm at this time that I was able to insert two implants. But on the left side, because, of, because the, the space was very narrow 
and I like to sleep uh, all, li all my night long, I use a, a, a drilling guide. So through my uh, simulation, I send all the information to a company based in Belgium, which name is Materialize, and they send me a, a drilling guide, as you can see, in resin. It goes on the occlusal uh, uh, aspect of all, all the teeth, also in the palatal on, in the, on the buccal aspect. And I was able to, to go through the, the guide with my uh, uh, two millimeters first drill. And after it was easy, to realize, to, to insert the, the other uh, birds, the other drill. At the end of my session, I sent the lady to his dentist and he put immediately provisional teeth on the two implants. And at this time, we wait for two months. It is, a, I will say, a classical lens to obtain osseo integration. And after the two months, uh, my pros uh, referee uh, insert to a uh, ceramic crown on the, on the implant. I proposed to the lady to cover the, the root surface, but she was not concerning about this problem. She, she was very happy uh, about the result, the aesthetic result. Of course, she has no more uh, hole in a uh, uh, denture. So she was about happy about this and she refused uh, the connective tissue graft just to cover the root on the two canine. So the main question uh, today is if you decided to insert an implant, and again, I, I, at this time, I definitely don't, don't know if it's a good solution, but if you decided to insert an implant, the main problem is at which age we are able to insert an implant in the mouth of our young patient. And theoretically, we always repeat to our uh, patient, but also to our auto referees that we have to wait two years after the end of growing. And the end of growing for female is about 16 to 17 year old and for male to 19, uh, 18 to 19 year old. That means that if you want to insert an implant in, in a mouse of a young female, you have to wait to 19, 20 years old. And for a male, to 20, 21 year old. I know that uh, auto are able to precise if uh, growing is definitely finished by doing an X-ray of a part of the hand. But the main problem when auto is finished is which kind of temporization we can put in the mouth of the patient. I will give you the, the example of France. We have what we call social security. That means that if uh, in aut an auto treatment is done in the mouth of a young patient, is beginning in the mouth of a young patient between 15 year old, one five, 15 year old, there will be a, a small amount of reimbursement and maybe some private insurance will have some other reimbursement. So the main age uh, of the end of an auto treatment in France is about, let's say, 15 to 16 year old. So if you decide to, to insert an implant in the mouth of a young patient and you have to wait until 20 to 21 year old, what will be the best temporization? The best temporization without any negative, negative effect on teeth, negative effect on the periodontium on the, of the adjacent teeth. So I, need, I think that definitely the best solution is to use a bonded bridge. Bonded bridge have been proposed at the beginning of the 80s. And for example, in France, we have, been, we have a lot of French dentists who write several papers about bonded bridges. Bonded bridges are not 
plain Maryland bridges as they as have been proposed by American team. What we call bonded bridges in France is with preparation of the enamel on the lingual aspect of the two adjacent teeth and using those small pins, as you see on the drawing, those, those small green pins, they, uh, they are realized with very small drill. And when the practitioner do the printed, those small uh, pins came with the printed. And in the lab, they are able to do the same in metal. And uh, after the bridges are bonded with several uh, uh, products. Here you can see different uh, proposal with metallic uh, uh, bonded on the lingual aspect of the teeth and of course uh, aesthetic uh, uh, ceramic. Here the, the pros decided to have uh, insert insertion only on the two central incisors, as you can see, and a cantilever extension. But today uh, we have a, an elegant proposal, as you can see on the right uh, side of this slide. Here you have two cantilever bridges, but they are totally in ceramic, in zirconia. Just have a look on the palatal aspect of the two of the two uh, bonded bridges, you can see that there is only one retainer on the central aspect of the two central incisor, on the palatal aspect, sorry, of the two central incisors. It was one of my, of my patients, so I, I sent the, this young lady to, to the pros, and he asked me to make only a crown lengthening on the palatal aspect of, of the two central incisors, just to have more uh, surface in contact between the enamel and the ceramic. What is very important is this study coming from uh, Germany. Uh, Dr. Kern is a professor in a German university. And in this paper, he observed uh, the long-term uh, survival at 10 years concerning bridges with two retainers and bridges with one retainers. And when I read this paper, and this paper is recent, I was very disappointed because I learned when I was just at the beginning of my practice, I learned I, how to do bonded bridges with two retainers. I, I am practicing since 40 years, but during 10 years, I was a GP before stopping uh, uh, dentistry and, and doing only PIO and, and, uh, and implant surgery. So I was very disappointed when I see this result. But there is a lot of papers today which confirm that there is more survival at 10 years with only one bonded bridge with, sorry, a bonded bridge with one retainer only. Just have a look to this wonderful case. Those photos have been sent by one of my friends. You see the two, uh, only it's Zirconia bridge, only ceramic. The, this practitioner, he, he have prepared the gum with a round uh, diamond burr just to create a small concavity. And as you, can, as you can see, the, the cantilever, it seems that it goes out of the gum. And you see the wonderful result, the wonderful aesthetic result and the wonderful integration concerning the gum on the cantilever. Matthias Kern, the, the, the professor from, from Germany, he was present about one year ago in November in Paris at the ADF Congress. ADF means uh, uh, dental, French Dental Association. And every year on November, we have a huge Congress, about four or five days. And Matthias Kern was in the session. So I go in the session just to attend his lecture. And this is the photos of one of his slides they make in, in, his, in, in his laboratory in the, in the German university. 
they make the comparison between a, a lot of uh, uh, ceramics. And their conclusion is that the zirconia ceramic gave the maximum uh, resistance and the maximum uh, 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 survival rate at 10 years. But there is also other proposal. For example, these cases have been sent it to me by one of my auto referees, Dr. Marinetti. It is a, a, a he make a treatment in, the, in an adult patient, but this, this adult patient received a first treatment when he was adolescent. But there is a relapse, again, some moving of the teeth and the, the patient is not very uh, happy about the, the aesthetic result. So there is again a second uh, uh, orthodontic treatment in, on the, with lingual braces. But what is interesting is, is at the end, the cosmetic result. It is a fiber reinforced composite bonded bridge. And you see the, the palatal aspect. So there is a splinted of all the six five, of course, anterior teeth, because there is one agenesis. But the, the dentist would do this uh, bonded uh, uh, bridge. Uh, added also cosmetic on the peg shape uh, tooth on the left side. And uh, also a, a total cosmetic replacement of the uh, agenesis on the, on the right side. One of the interests of this proposal is, is, is that it is in composite of course, reinforced with fibers. So, so in the future, if there is something will break, it's very easy to correct, to repair it. In the literature, there is also other proposal. For example, vertical mini screw. Here we are in Belgium with a team from, the, from Eric Rompen, uh, Professor Eric Rompen. So they used uh, uh, two uh, uh, branded uh, mini implant. So there is 13 implant, 20 patient. The follow-up, sorry, it's again in French. The follow-up is one to 7.5 years. You see the brand, the brand of the, in, the mini screw, A new and Dentatus. The diameter the lens, and the result, the survival. There is also another proposal. Um, it results from an observation from the professor Birt Milsen. Uh, all, the, the, all the ortho who participate to this webinar know the name of Birt Milsen. She just retired, I think, but she was a orthodontic professor in uh, Sweden, maybe. Maybe it's a mistake, I don't know exactly. But she observed if you insert horizontal mini screw in an edentulous crest, as you can see on the left side, first, you conserve the bone volume. But second, you observe around the head of the mini screw, uh, a bone uh, uh, augmentation, physiologically bone augmentation. So after this uh, uh, study on animal, uh, they propose this kind of solution to replace lateral incisors. As you can see, there is a mini screw on the palatal aspect. The mini screw is inserted more or less in an horizontal position. And linked to the mini screw, there is a, maybe a rectangular wire. Uh, as all the auto can do, there is a several uh, uh, axes, applicators, and a cosmetic part is bond on this metallic wire. But I, I spoke with uh, some friend of mine, Otto, who have done this kind of proposal, and they said that uh, there is a lot of complication, breaking of the uh, rectangular metallic wire, but also breaking of the part of the cosmetic uh, uh, 
uh, cosmetic tea tools. So today, some of them think that if you decided to put a, one retainer bonded bridge, maybe it will be interested to insert also an horizontal screw in the endotelus area, only to conserve, conserve the bone volume and maybe to augment it. We always spoke about our result, our con consideration. We are more or less happy about our result. And in a lot of paper, the evaluation is, is a dentist evaluation. But today we find in the literature a lot of studies concerning what the patients think about their smile or what they think about the result of any pros uh, uh, treatment of any other den dental consideration, uh, uh, other dental treatment. So concerning the agenesis of the max maxillary lateral incisors, this recent paper is uh, from uh, an Italian team and they divided uh, uh, the patient in three groups. The first one is closing the space and transforming the canine in lateral. The second group is opening the space and inserting an implant. And the third group is complete, complete arches. And photos are given to dentist, lay person, that means person that are totally out of the dental world, and patients themselves. And they ask to those three people, those three family of people to evaluate uh, the smile attractiveness using a visual analog scale on photos and photographies of dentures. So there is few difference between dentist and lay persons. Male dentist and female lay persons are more critical. All patients have a high level of satisfaction concerning this, their smile, hopefully. That means that even if you choose to close the space and transform the canine in lateral, or you choose to open it and insert an implant, there is a high level of satisfaction, satisfaction concerning the, the smile for the group of patients who see the photos. But the most satisfied were the patient when they decided to close the space and to transform the canine in a lateral. So the question of course is to close or not to, not to close. And I definitely think that only orthodontists are able to decide it if it's possible technically to close the space. What I mean by technically, for example, if you receive a patient, a young patient with one or two uh, agenesis of the lateral incisors. And the canine and the first molar are in perfect class one. Do you decide whatever to close the space or do you decide to conserve the space and to choose between implant or one retainer bonded bridge? So definitely orthodontists are able to give us the answer is it technically possible to close? I know that with mini screw, everything is now possible. But maybe orthodontists are also able to tell us if the profile of the patient will be changed or if the, the width of the upper jaw will be a little narrow and maybe the level of the, the upper lips will not be at the good position. So I always ask the same patient, the same question to my auto referees. Is it easy for you to close the space or not? Here you have a paper again from a team with Zachrison, but you have also Rosa. And they write this paper recently, you see in 2016. And the question was, if we decided to close a space, is there any periodontal? or occlusal problem 10 years after. 
So the conclusion was that there is no long-term periodontal occlusal discrepancy. Just have a look to this, this first case. The two canines are in contact with the two central incisors. Remind, uh, remind one of the paper I just uh, gave to you on uh, the other slides. If, we decided to if you decided to open the space, you will have a thinner bone crest. You will move the level of the crest in a much higher position, and the concavity on the buccal aspect will be deeper. They decided to transform the canine in lateral, but to transform it, they also decided to make an aggression of the two canine. When you make an aggression of the two canine, you move also in a coronal position the, the level of the gum. And you can also regularly eliminate it, the point of the canine. And at the end of the auto treatment, they just have to add, to add in the great majority of cases, a small amount of composite on the measure aspect just, just to recreate the angle, the measure angle of the, of the canine transform in lateral. In their proposal, they also make a small ingression of the, of the first premolar in the position of canine, just to move the level of the gum in a more apical direction. Don't forget that one of the criteria of the level of the gum in the six anterior teeth is that the, the level of the gum and the canine and the level of the gum and the central incisors are horizontal. And just have a look on the right, on the photo on the right side, and you will see that by ingressing a little the first premolar in position of the canine, they move also the level of the gum in a more apical direction creating the triangle between the level of the gum from canine to central and the level of the gum of the lateral incisor is in a more, in a more coronal position. Again, another uh, clinical case with the same decision. Closing, of course, uh, um, a good occlusion, but not opening the space. Aggression of the canine, and ingression, a little ingression of the first premolar, a little torque, they propose also to have a little torque, just to put the palatal cuspid in a more apical position. But you can also use a burr and reduce a small amount of enamel on the palatal cusp of the first premolar just to avoid any contact in non-working uh, lateral de deviation movement. As a conclusion, I just want to give you two sentences coming out of a paper recently written by Matthias Kern. I give you in several papers, but also one slide concerning the choice of which ceramic to use. Matthias Kern was invited in the International Journal of Pros in 2017. And he said that most recent clinical studies on zirconia ceramic show a survival rate of 98.2% at 10 years. Again, a bonded bridge with one retainer only the survival rate is 98% at 10 years. And he says that, he thinks that definitely we need to reconsider the fact that the implant, the single implant is the best solution, not only for agenesis of the lateral incisors, but maybe for one of the four incisors. And during his, his lecture in Paris in November, in last year in November, he shows us a lot, of, a lot of bonded bridges with one retainer replacing 
lateral incisors, but also central incisors, and in some uh, specific occlusal concern, also canine. So I try to give you an answer concerning the title of my lecture is implant the best solution to replace a maxillary lateral incisor agenesis. And I think today that definitely is not the good solution. But not only for lateral incisors, but also maybe for other anterior teeth in the upper jaws, but also in the lower jaw. Today, there is proposal to replace, for example, a central incisor or a lateral incisor on, on the lower jaw by a bonded ridge with a new one retainer on one of the adjacent teeth. And the, sh the choice of the adjacent teeth will be uh, uh, done through the, the surface of the enamel to optimize the bonding of the, this one retainer bonded bridge. <clears throat> I am now uh, open to all the questions, so don't hesitate, don't be shy. Uh, uh, you, usually in, in the room, people are shy to ask for questions, but today you are invisible on the other side of the web, so don't hesitate to ask any question. Um. Jean-Marc, um, thank you so much. It's a very, very interesting um, lecture that you just gave us. Um, basically, because it's a, it's a topic where we usually have to um, uh, make up a nice result based on, on teeth that are not present. So therefore, we have to join the, um, the requirements of, of uh, the patient in terms of uh, achieving a functional occlusion Yeah. Uh, but still, we have to uh, also take into consideration uh, class two, class three, how, how discrepant are the, 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 the bone bases, and then uh, so many other aspects, as you told us with uh, this, that's either bone growth or bone remodeling. Yeah. So it's, it's so interesting, um, and we have a few, a few questions. Great. The first one is... Uh, Would you, would you start uh, uh, reconsidering the, the use of implants in favor of uh, this uh, bonded bridges? Yeah, uh, definitely. Definitely. When, okay. you, when, you, see, when you see all the... All, all, all the I, I, had, I gave about six references, uh, papers coming out of different journals. And as you can see, all the papers observed the same result uh, uh, after 10, 15, 22 years. I know that a lot of practitioners, uh, the, I will say their business, a lot of practitioners, maybe in your country, in France, everywhere, the main basis of your business is to show you how in one session they extract the central incisors, they insert a, a, an implant, They put bone substitute, uh, 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 a connective tissue graft, and an uh, immediate provisional uh, tooth. And je, je, they, saw you, they, je, je, they, they show you the result six months after, one year after. But you have seen in one of the clinical cases I have shown, six years after, it seemed that the, the crown on the lateral incisor wa was in a buccal direction, in a more buccal direction. So definitely, I think that maybe we have to reconsider the fact that implant is the best solution for the, 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 the anterior upper jaw. Uh, one year ago, there was the European Academy of Osseointegration Integration Congress in Lisbon. And uh, one of the major practitioner uh, presenting lecture was uh, Urzeler. Urzeler is from, from Switzerland, and he, he have a lot of experience concerning implant in the anterior upper jaw. And he sent two slides on the screen, and one of the, sli of the slide was, is implant the best solution for the upper anterior teeth? Coming from this guy, who give uh, 
hundreds of lectures all around the world about implanting the anterior area. So even this guy who have a lot of experience think today that maybe it's not the best solution. Well, maybe, maybe. It, well, it's it's so interesting. You, the 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 evidence that you're showing is so 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 well well retrieved as well. Um, one thing that might be interesting to to work on is to to put more into distal positions the this this implant uh, replacements. So, in, in at, at least in my experience, I've I've started to um, whenever possible to install the implants in a, in, in a premolar position. Mm -hmm. And I try to put him be, between the, 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 the first premolar and the molar when you have uh, this, this when, 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 when it's possible. Then you have a bit best preservance of the, of the bone and then yeah. you, you're not so, so um, um, uh, affected by this, this growth. Maybe, well, that's, that's something, but it's, it's your lecture. Um, no, no, I, I, I totally agree with your proposal. That means that you close the space, moving the canine in the lateral position, and you open a space on the distal, distal aspect of the canine. Okay? No, no, this is to the first premolar. So yes. then, you leave, then, 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 then you can leave the, the, the bicuspid as a okay. cuspid. With all this, this uh, aspect, the, 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 um, the, the, the concepts that, that you gave okay. us, in terms of the palatal cusp, the, okay. the, the, the zenith of the yeah. tooth, and then you put in, in the disposition. But well, even, hmm? even with your proposal, there is today paper that, that show that even on the first premolar, there is vertical discrepancies after some years. For sure. Sometimes, uh, maybe in the audience, there is people who, who, who put implant in the mouth of their patient, but regularly we can observe that after, after several years that the contact point between the crown and an implant and the neighboring natural tooth open. Again, all our teeth moves during our life. And uh, an implant, what is an implant? It is a, like an enclosed teeth. And all of the orthodontists in the attendees know that we are not able to move ankylose teeth. For theorically, sure. Theorically. <laughs> theorically. Because there is a French team who develop a technique to move, uh, uh, to move in, uh, ankylose, ankylose teeth. And what but, are they doing? Ah, <laughs> um, I invite you to go uh, on Google and to look to uh, orthodontic bone stretching, orthodontic bone stretching. Uh -huh. uh, it is a team from a dental university in the south of France. And they, they work, uh, the, the team from the, no, it is the perio teams and the auto teams from the dental university in the south of France in the city of Montpellier. And they developed the, the orthodontic bone stretching. Rapidly, they open a flap and they do uh, a groove, uh, something similar that, that, than the, the technique, accelerated orthodontic technique, which have de been developed by Ferguson and, uh, and uh, I uh, don't remember the name yeah. of the two, the two Polish, uh, English, uh, no, uh, American guys. Ferguson and uh, I don't Wilco. know. Wilco. Wilco. Yes, the Wilco brother, I remember. When Ferguson and Wilco came, in Paris, I, I was attending to, to their lecture and during the lunch, I sit on, on the other side of the perio and I had asked him a lot of questions during all the, the lunch. But they open a flap, they do a vertical groove uh, about one millimeter large, about five millimeter deep, only on the buccal aspect of the ankylosed teeth, on the mesial and on the distal and on the apical part. And they immediately tracked the tooth, but not with orthodontic forces, with orthopedic forces, that means more than 200 grams. And what they observed is that the tooth move. But of course, it's not the tooth who move because the periodontal ligament is not present. It is the, a stretching of the bone, but they, we, they are able to move teeth. Wow. 
they write two papers and one one is in english maybe on the oral maxillofacial uh, journal something like this but i i can send the I can send to Victor the, 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 some precision, precision about the two papers. And there, there is also a, a kind of video in English on, a, on a Google. Today, they are also able to move implant. I repeat, to move implant with the same technique. Yeah. For example, in, in the cases I show you, when the implant is in infra position after some years. They open a flap, a groove on mesial, groove on distal, groove apical, and they move orthodontically the implant by stretching the bone. Crazy. With no, with no palatal uh, osteotomy. No. So just no, no, no. buckle. Yes, only buckle. Only. We'll have to work on that. Well, it, it's, it's, it sounds great. It's, it's um, it's very interesting, very a strategy, very interesting. Very and and uh, what what is your experience uh, using this um, this uh, mini screws uh, on the on the uh, upper lateral position uh, to preserve the bone? Um, Personally, I don't have any ex experience on this, but as I, as I say, uh, it was first described by Dirk Melsen uh, in. Uh, in Scandinavian country, but recently uh, um, uh, uh, um, a young uh, orthodontist uh, uh, make uh, a French young orthodontist make during his PAG uh, 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 in auto, he make a study about it, and they 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 try to associated horizontal uh, mini screw on the palatal aspect and. Uh, uh, bonded bridge with, with one, one retainer. But personally, I don't have any experience about it. Mm. There, there's um, Jason Cope, that's an that's a American orthodontist. He has some, some experiences, has published using, using two millimeter uh, surface treat, treated uh, mini implants, uh, mm -hmm. but are two to 2.5 millimeter in width. So he puts them in the, in the vertical position mm -hmm. over the, the, the ridge. Yeah. Um, he shows very nice results, but um, but still, yeah. when you use that kind of that that sort of, of, of uh, appliances, it's basically an also integrated implant. So then, yes. in the long run, you will find out the, the, the same yes. situation. Yes, but maybe it's more easy to take out when, when uh, maybe ten years, maybe more. If there is a vertical discrepancies, maybe it's more easy to take out this kind of uh, mini implants, as you can, as you say, two, two, three millimeter diameter, and to insert another one. But uh, the principle of OCO integration is that theoretically it's impossible to take out an implant. Theoretically. Perfect. Perfect. And if you decided to take out an implant. Sometimes it's very difficult, and after it, you need to again make a bone graft. So again, uh, time on the chair, fees associated with the time on the chair, pain for the patient, and so and so. So it's very important that at the beginning of the of the treatment in your practice, when you receive children with a, a, a genesis of the lateral incisors, to explain to the parents that it will be a, a long trip. If they decided to, if they decided to choose the implant solution first and second, that the implant solution is not for lifelong, because of the vertical discrepancies and the movement of the ages and teeth in the long term. But not, not only in the, in the long term. You have seen the cases six years, only six years. So six years is it is not long term. That's right. Well, I don't know, Carlos, Victor, if we have more questions from the audience. Uh, Carlos? Uh, thank you, Jean-Marc. I, I want a question. Yeah. In, the, in the case that we have a growing patient uh, where the final therapeutic uh, decision is to conserve or open the space for future implant rehabilitation, 
which is the best option to preserve bound and high and with uh, uh, may, may, maybe to associated bonded bridge and uh, horizontal uh, uh, horizontal mini screw inserted on the palatal aspect with the mini with the horizontal mini screw you conserve the bone and theoretically as uh, Birt Melsen show you maybe maybe you increase the bone volume but minimum you conserve it and uh, aesthetically the the bonded bridge with with run one retainer is very interesting as you you have seen in the uh, on different uh, uh, clinical cases. But if you think about it, why, to, why to, to choose maybe 10, 12, 20 years after to move to an implant? Why not to con conserve the bonded bridge with, with one, re one retainer? Okay. You, are, you have seen the, the long-term survival at 10 years. Nine, uh, 98 person, 98% and I, uh, I don't speak about periimplantitis, mucositis, those are also complications and today there is some papers who say that at five years there is more or less 40, 40, 40 implant with our, our uh, mucositis or periodontitis. That means that, in a way, those pathologies are uh, dentist-induced pathologies because we decided to insert implant in the mouth of patient with a bad level of uh, plaque control, for example, or in a patient who smoke. And we know that the plaque control and smoke are uh, have real bad effect on, on the survival of implants. And when you decided to insert an implant in the mouth of a patient of 20 year old, we know today how this implant will be in 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And uh, uh, in France, but maybe it is the same in your country, uh, the surviving age of a female is about 82 years. So when you, do, you decided to insert an implant in the mouth of a patient of 20 years, are you able to imagine how this implant will be 60 years after? It's, oh, today we don't have any answer. We have answer about implant after 22 years as you have seen in one of the paper. But I know today, I know that titanium today, what I mean by titanium is the world of implant, of course. Titanium is like a waves and a, a, a grit of a, a large majority of dentists forget that we are able to restore an anterior teeth. Even with an endo problem, we, we can do a apical surgery. If there is a perio problem, we can regenerate a part of the periodontium around an anterior teeth. So titanium is not a miracle. And titanium is not the treatment of periodontitis. Titanium is not the, the treatment of endodontitis. <laughs> I see that you are smiling. <laughs> yes, I know. I, what, what happens is that, that, that uh, that 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 has to do with many things. Has to do with ethics. Yeah. Has to do with with evidence. Yeah. Has to do with with what are the objectives of a certain treatment. If you're aiming at what sort of long term is long term for you, and what is acceptable, and what is good, and what is extra good. And yeah. you know, sometimes extra good means very nice today, and yeah. a, 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 a total replacement in 10 more years. Mm -hmm. So then it goes, the, it, all, the, all those things go down to what is your perspective and your philosophy about what we do in dentistry. You know, so yeah. I, I believe that you just gave us a wonderful webinar, a wonderful lecture in a, in, a, in, a, in a topic that has to do with, with those real problems that don't, that are not necessarily related to uh, 
this is a bit crowded. No, it has to do with something that 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 crosses the the realm of um, perio implant dentistry, prosto, yeah. ortho, and that gets more complex as you have a look on the long run. Mm -hmm. So so you you have made us think a lot. We yeah. are we have all work home, uh, home, homework to do. I um, hope to, I hope to I think I think that you are disturbed. And I'm happy that you are disturbed. No, I'm not. I think <laughs> not that, that you I, I think that all the attendants may, are maybe and maybe tomorrow, if they decided to insert an implant in the anterior area of the upper jaw, maybe they will think and think and think. <laughs> <laughs> the good solution or not. So that's a, that's a very nice problem that you gave us. So thank you so much for your time. Thank uh, you. Muchas gracias a todos los que están, estuvieron con nosotros hoy día. Um, y, y, y gracias, Jean-Marc, por estar con nosotros. Thank you, Jean-Marc. Thank you. I, I hope to see you in the next future, not through the web, but uh, physically, I will say. I hope to meet you, I don't know where. So we are all hoping that this, this epidemic will end and we will be able to meet again uh, our friends all around the world. So take care about you. Again, thank you about your, your kindly invitation and uh, hope to meet you in the next future. Same there. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Muchas gracias.